and why it's a good idea. And really, in a lot of ways, uh, the theme of this is that, yes, Slicer is a really big, complicated thing, but so are medical imaging and robotics. They're very complicated topics to take on. And a lot of the questions we all face is, when are we reinventing the wheel? When can we take advantage of what other people have done? And uh, so I'm gonna give you a tour of that. So first with the why. Um, <clears throat> why? Because Laura was able to pick up, uh, <laughs> you'll hear much more about this than I could ever tell you, was able to pick up uh, Slicer and in, in the course of her, uh, you know, her, her work now, I don't even know how long she's been a PhD student on this, but she just presented uh, a really sophisticated uh, application with a very complicated robot, a controller, a uh, surgical planning uh, scenario, and all this using the free and open source software. So this is uh, a real, real life example. And so I'm looking forward to hearing more about what she's been up to. Uh, but in some ways, you know, the, the purpose of 3D Slicer is to be something that you can just sort of download and expect to use. It's a desktop <coughs> desktop application, uh, but it's, it's important to note that it's been maintained actively, continues to be actively maintained, which is a a very important aspect of, of any dependency you're considering taking on for your work. Um, just some statistics about it. Uh, it's been you know, downloaded lots of times as a um, application. And there's a lot of activity on our uh, discussion forum, um, but also probably for the academics in the room, you know, the publication impact is kind of a key metric. And we're very excited that in 2022, we've surpassed even Mimics, which is a commercial system in terms of references for scholarly uh, publications. And you, know, you can see this, this kind of growth curve in, in citations looking really uh, you know, sort of hockey stick-like, I guess, as they say, right? Exponential growth. So we're, we're you know, very cognizant of the, of the scientific impact. And some history, I won't go into all the details. Many, many people have been involved over the years. This actually started, uh, you know, out of kind of a, a, a long-term collaboration between the people at Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, Ron Kikinis in particular, uh, the people have been trying some different things and experimenting with, with intraoperative uh, imaging. And really it was the collaboration with Eric Grimson and the folks at the MIT AI lab that turned it into more of a platform that was reusable. And it was a really uh, trying to avoid reinventing the wheel. And you still see that a lot where people kind of say, well, you know, I don't want to get bogged down with a big platform. I want to just start from, you know, main, and then I write my code. No, nothing against that approach, but there is a lot of value in just sort of stepping into something that's already uh, got some history. I, I would say, and I'll come back to this, but <clears throat> the Slicer license has kind of been a key building block. We had a lot of discussion, like, in big groups talking about how we wanted to position ourselves in terms of, of the software licenses. And we've decided on this BSD style license to explicitly promote the involvement and probably the most important of this is industry involvement. Uh, this came out of a, a grant called the National Alliance for Medical Image Computing, which was a multi-institution uh, grant that included uh, several commercial entities, including my own company, Isomics, but also Kitware and GE. And we really wanted to make sure that what we did was not going to be siloed off into an academic pursuit that was never going to make it into supporting clinical products. And so we explicitly tried to avoid any kind of patent restrictions, any kind of uh, reciprocal licensing like a, like, a, uh, like a new public license, because we had found that that was a, a barrier. And we specifically, because there were 15 different institutions, we also didn't want to be in a position where if somebody wanted to take a key algorithm that was going to enable a really important clinical product, we didn't want them to have to feel like they were going to have to negotiate with 15 different universities and institutions to, to get a license. So we, we, we really tried to capture all that in this uh, document. Um, <clears throat> so today you've got uh, you know a modern platform. Really, in some ways, it's kind of an outline for some other topics I'll bring up, but but you know, the, the, the goal of it is that right now you've, you've got something that's ready to go and um, something to build off of. So a lot of the, a lot of the development in, um, in sort of driving Slicer has been clinical applications that are integrations of uh, imaging and something tangible, you know, operating, <laughs> uh, you know, an intervention of some sort. And it has 
you know, as a result, Slicer's got a lot of, a lot of uh, interfaces that have been well developed. Also, some methodologies, and so some of these terms get used more often than not. But um, Slicelets refers to kind of a custom interface. It no longer looks like Slicer; it's a script that takes over and builds its own front end. And a guidelet is kind of that for surgical navigation uh, with some building blocks. But also there's the concept of a slicer custom application, which is the idea that you take over the entire user interface and the programming environment. So you maybe add new libraries, take out others, interface to, to devices. And, and right now our sort of star of the show for that uh, custom application concept is something called NewNav, which is uh, really uh, out of the incredibly hard work of Dr. Alexander Golby. She was a keynote speaker here last year. And she is a, a, a really amazing person who's both a, a practicing neurosurgeon and a, just an incredible uh, researcher. And she has received funding and, and really pioneered this concept of developing a, a navigation system for low and middle income countries that will use commodity off the shelf hardware and open source software and also open source hardware, which you can't really see in here, but some of the, the devices and the uh, instrumentation is all 3D printable or easy to manufacture uh, using off the shelf parts. And it really is kind of, you know, the difference between Slicer as a kind of an extension of the operating system with a million things and a turnkey ready to use application for surgeons. Uh, so also getting back to Core Slicer, there are at this point, around 152 and growing extensions. What we've tried to do in the architecture is to take anything that's sort of application specific or you know, specialty, put them into, into things that are associated with it. So Slicer CMF is for craniomaxillofacial surgery. You know, we try to take some, most of the concepts that, that belong naturally to that kind of an environment and put them into extensions, which are easy to download and install. And then we also have certain specialized core functionality you can build on like Slicer VR that is for virtual reality. It's, it's not something everybody needs, so we don't really want it too much in the core. Not that the core is lightweight, but it's least, you know, tends to be less, uh, less diverse. So here's an example of virtual reality. It's actually was, has, has, you know, the community has been evolving virtual reality community. And so the software side of it's been a little bit of a pain. But now there's OpenXR, and then Slicer, Slicer uses VTK OpenXR. So as of uh, what week before last, it's all working again. So if anybody you know had tried to use it uh, in the last uh, year or so, people were referred back to like an older version of Slicer to make it work. Now the current version works. But what's nice about it is that what you see in VR is just the 3D view of Slicer. So all the things you see on a desktop, you can see. What's even more amazing now, and this again is after uh, Chava's hard work for several years now, any user interface widget that you can see on the desktop, traditional buttons and menus, now you can sort of see it as a textured plane in the VR environment and you can interact with it with a controller, sort of a laser pointer to put buttons and stuff. So it's pretty fully functional. And I, I, I think we don't have a lot of practical applications for it yet, but I think people are looking very hard at how to make that all work. Um, Another ex ex exciting development over the last couple of years has been cloud rendering. Um, this is an example. There's a movie version of this, but we won't, don't really have time for it anyway. Um, but what's cool is that you can now on a cloud computer that you can rent literally by the hour, you can get whatever size computer you have available to, you know, I mean, humans make whatever size computers available. So the ones, for example, you can get like an 80 gigabyte <laughs> memory machine for a couple of dollars an hour. Um, this is a little older video, this is a 40 gigabyte one, but this is a, a really amazing brain data set and it's fun to play with. It's, it's freely available. It's a 0.1 millimeter uh, isotropic voxel uh, MRI scan, a seven Tesla scan, it took 100 hours on the machine, but it's 1700 by 1700 by 1200 floats. And so it's really intricate and detailed. You see amazing things about the brain. And this I've been playing around with, you know, on a cloud computer, you can actually render it in VR and see it in headset interactively and like see this giant brain in front of you. It's it's a fun experiment for sure. And and uh, you know, but the good thing is it's still the standard slicer binary. There's nothing special uh, really about the whole setup. Uh, so I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but 
there is a lot of flexibility too. Um, Slicer, you can run it in a Docker container, which shouldn't really be a surprise because you can just run a virtual desktop inside the Docker container, but architecturally it lets you integrate things, processing modules, things for like rendering that you can do inside, you know, a container means that you can run on Kubernetes clusters or whatever. And then there's a flip side of that. Um, Slicer also comes with a Qt web engine, which is basically Chrome, Chromium. And what that means is you can do things like, like this, where you have a web page that's already well established. Uh, MorphoSource is a repository of scanned specimens, in this case, a gorilla. Um, and it has logins and information panels and all the web stuff that you want. But it's also because Slicer is hosting that web page all the hooks are there so that you can add a button to download it directly into Slicer and interact with it, and put things back, that sort of thing. So anyway, lots of, lots of possibilities in that. And then uh, kind of the biggest news in the last couple of years is that AI is finally working, you know, that segmentation is delivering really, really useful uh, results. Um, so we have a really productive environment now where you can use Slicer for all the things that are kind of traditional medical imaging. So processing the DICOM data, handling segmentations, and then use tools like Monai Label and NNUNet to do uh, training. Usually we do that offline, make it days or weeks, but the results then you can see inside of the Slicer environment. And it's, it's now to the point where you can sort of do active learning, see the results, edit the results, retrain, and uh, we're seeing just remarkable results. I mean, anybody who's tried to segment a a complicated spine and you know, see the, the set joints where the bones are touching. It's, it's a really complicated problem that's basically solved. Really love getting a shout out from the CEO of NVIDIA and uh, using Slicer in his keynote. So there's there's a, a, actually a good synergy with the, um, you know, with the big cloud companies and the NVIDIA and others. Okay, so that was kind of like the sales pitchy kind of version. I hope I'm not going out too far over time here, but I'm, Want to kind of translate that because I think a lot of people here are computer scientists or more hands-on and trying to translate some of that into perspectives of, of you know sort of what that means for you as a developer, right? And so what's nice about it is you know all this sort of you know kind of these goals. And again, I'm going to sort of talk about these, so I won't read these off to you now. I mean, these goals have all come from essentially developers trying to create their ideal platform, and I think you know. Several of us who who have built different systems over the years, you know, we've tried to take the lessons learned and put them into, uh, you know, into the wish list of what you know this ideal platform would look like. <clears throat> and a lot of it again comes back to the license. And what does that mean to you as a as a software developer? It means that you're never really going to lose access to this platform. You may work on other projects. You may do other things. People who have worked on projects, you know, and spent years know how you kind of become, you know, so used to the environment that like you reflexively think I have this problem. I want to solve it the way I solved it before. I shouldn't have to start from scratch. And anybody who's worked on commercial projects or even maybe let's say used a platform with a license, maybe you learn math, maybe you learn mathematics. Then you get to a place where, you know, oh, that's a couple thousand dollars extra that we're not going to pay. So now how do I do it? I don't know. But you won't have that problem, you know, if you invest your time in Python and learning some of these other um, core things. So, developing your skill set is really important. And you never know when you're going to come up with something. You're like, okay, you talk to somebody who says, oh, that's something you could really make a product out of. If you if you have this tool set, you can pick and choose. Okay, I want this robot controller, or I want this rendering technique that I that I developed before. So, for a lot of us, that's been a big motivation. <clears throat> And that carries through not just in the slicer code, but to all the dependencies. So we've been really, really careful again about not including GPL licensed code, but dependencies that can really fit that model. That you know, once you've learned to write a Qt interface or a VTK rendering system, you know that's always in your hip pocket. It's not the only way to do things, but it's a it's it's a uh, thing you can always rely on. <clears throat> And then we also have a, a process that's very open. We're really excited about, um, you know, the fact this, this is from several years ago, but we just had a meeting like this uh, in Montreal a week before last with, uh, uh, well, do you remember how many people were there? You had the statistics. 154 participants. 154 persons. 16 in person. And so it was a hybrid event. 
but you know, we, we've been doing this. It was the 39th uh, installment of this activity, and it's you know uh, going on almost 20 years. It's sort of a, a hack fest, a hackathon. Uh, but it's not the only way that people can interact with our community. Obviously, there's all the GitHub processes, this uh, discourse forum I mentioned. Um, we also have phone calls, regular um, you know, video conferences that people are free to join. So it's a very um, you know, sort of meritocratic, is, is maybe not the perfect term, it's sort of activityocratic. I mean, people who are involved and do things, you know, they get to make decisions because they're the ones doing it. Uh, but it, it's, it's working out really well that way. I want to say one other thing about <clears throat> the architecture, and a lot of people make architecture diagrams and they show how like their libraries fit together like jigsaw puzzle pieces. We try to avoid that because jigsaw puzzle pieces only make one picture, but Lego blocks can make all kinds of different things. Right? So, you know, these pieces, these building blocks are, you know, intentionally designed to stay, um, you know, sort of self-contained. So we're very careful about doing things like uh, making sure that our data model is really just about data. And it says, okay, I can save and restore the scene state without, uh, you know, including anything about the way the, the graphical components work. And we keep our things in a logic, which means that those are the algorithms. So they're a little different than the data, but they're not the same as the user interface. And then the user interface, in fact, has been swapped out probably three times in the history of Slicer without changing much about normal. This is an example. Um, <clears throat> so a kind of a key point too, I mentioned this, you can get big GPU memory. You can also get like cloud computers with up to like 11 terabytes of RAM. these days. I mean, that's like something you can just get if you need it. And so when we talk about these you know, high resolution scans or big data sets from packs or whatever, all these things have been integrated into the rendering, the computation, you can access them as, uh, you know, uh, NumPy arrays and operate on them in, you know, whatever method you want. So, so computationally, I don't want to be restrained by that. I love the web as a platform and everything about WebGL and JavaScript, but, you know, when you're kind of isolated from the, from the real computer, you know, you're going to hit limits that, you, you know, you don't really want to have to compromise on. Um, and the same thing with the hardware, um, you know, multi-threading, uh, being able to sort of write your sort of perfect uh, allocation of, of your problem onto multiple cores, uh, and then also some, you know, interface to things like CUDA. Um, <clears throat> so again, these, these kinds of uh, things are, are something that somebody who's writing a native, you know, developer who's really into writing you know, good code doesn't want to doesn't want to compromise, and they want to have access to that. So Slicer facilitates that. Um, I guess another big thing, and this is maybe even more important for developers who are coming to the world from an engineering perspective, they may not know much about clinical medical imaging. They nobody in the world knows everything there is to know about DICOM. Not even David Clooney, who is probably knows as much as anyone in the world about it. There's a lot. A lot to it and a lot of things about linear and nonlinear transforms and about the way time series work and the way people expect to see uh, data display <clears throat> in terms of you know orientation conventions what kind of uh, rendering makes sense to different clinical scenarios so a lot of that um, is hard hard one knowledge that's now incorporated into tools that are um, you know that are built in and even though it comes from a medical imaging domain, there's a lot of other purposes for this data, or for this, this set of tool tooling. And some of them, you know, really amaze me. They, they have developed over the years. So Slicer Morph is probably the biggest community of users that come from biological morphometry. So there are people studying, literally, I'm not kidding, snake genitalia and <laughs> like a crazy stuff. Um, but also, um, you know, astronomy, there's a lot of 3D data. 3D in, in astronomy tends to be azimuth elevation and velocity. So it's 3D, but very, very different. But uh, David Punzio and others have made that work. And just recently, a couple of really interesting ones came up. <clears throat> there was a, a guy who didn't make it to Project Week, but he came to some of the planning calls. They do these uh, deep sea explorations with these submersibles, not the ones that have billionaires imploding, but like um, they send down these uh, <laughs> these probes with this sort of X-ray scanning equipment, and they look at like jellyfish, and they can scan the jellyfish 
in the deep sea environment and they get 3D volumes. And this guy was telling us how important, how, there's a whole paper, you can read it, look, look it up, but it's, it's fascinating, these things, creatures you can only imagine. And then just recently, another guy, uh, there's a whole project out of NASA where they do micro CT of porous materials. And when they talk about porous materials, they mean like, you know, like woven composites. But it turns out what they're really looking at is like, how will this particular woven composite work as a parachute on Mars? Because it's like semi, you know, it's, it's got to be lightweight and strong, but it's got to let, you know, the atmosphere through it. So these amazing images of like, you know, and this using AI, they, they integrated the Facebook uh, segment anything model so that they could take these micro CTs of parachute material and individually segment each part of the weave. And then they use that as the basis for their computational analysis of it. So it's, it's I mean, it's just really fun to see all this stuff. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, <clears throat> kind of the main next steps for getting familiar. Obviously you can just download Slicer, uh, explore it, uh, runs pretty much anywhere. There is very extensive documentation now on Read the Docs. Um, the discourse community is the place to ask questions. Um, it's funny nowadays, people ask questions and, and one of our colleagues is in uh, Switzerland, he's actually a, a, you know, a, a thoracic surgeon. He just always you know, says, well, here's what ChatGPT has to say. Here's the answer to the question, <laughs> which is really funny to see. And then, uh, of course, the source code is on GitHub. And anybody who wants is welcome to come to Project Week. And because it's, it's virtual, we now have a, like a lot of participation from many, many different countries. Uh, also, the, the internationalization effort of, of Slicer. Now we have two grants from the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation. And Sonia Pujol is the leader of this incredible effort that has regular collaboration now with people from Senegal and other countries in Africa, from Mexico, from uh, Brazil, uh, people from Argentina, really all over the world participating um, in Project Week now, which is really great. So I'm gonna wrap it up there. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you, thank you Steve. I guess we have uh, time for one question. Uh, I think we go to the next speaker. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, I'm gonna comment. So Steve, it's been great that you've been doing this for 20 years and contribute. Is there a succession plan? Right? <laughs> I mean, Not you've done yet. Or is this it right here? I, okay. I volunteer Colton for all says. Um, no, I, I mean, that is the, the, the fun part is that I feel like the um, there are people have sort of chosen things that they're most interested yes. in. And, you know, people who know Jean Christophe Pilia Robin from the Hitler know that he is the consummate build system expert. Yeah. Anything about how all these different packages come together and get deployed. Uh, Andres Lasso has become kind of the core new feature developer. Uh, so many new things have come up here. But we also find that there are really significant contributions you know, to the core from people around the world. The, the team in Norway that's developing neurosurgical, or I'm sorry, Slicer liver applications has added a lot of the new markup capabilities. So the ability to do beast lines and so forth. So that's kind of my hope. I mean, I'm happy to keep doing this as long as I could do it, but um, but it, the real goal, yeah, is to, is to make it more community driven, not, not just about me. Thank you very much. Yeah.